<laughs> okay, well, thank you um, very much for having us. I'm Rachel Seidman. I'm the acting director of the Southern Oral History Program. And I'm JC Voss. I'm the coordinator of collections for the Southern Oral History Program. So lots of different topics and um, I think we, we sort of plan to give you a brief overview of what we do, how we function, also getting into some of how we interpret the interviews once we've conducted them, how we share them in a few different ways. Um, but we can certainly also have a lot of time, I think, to go over your questions because um, they seem really good and they're a lot more broad than I was expecting, I guess. So I want to make sure we have time to really get to all those different things. Yeah. Um, and just so you know, um, JC and I um, come at this kind of from two different, I mean, we work together, but I, I'm trained as an historian and JC's trained as an archivist. So you're getting those two different perspectives on the work. Um, and so it's, you know, we can both respond to all of your questions, but you can also ask us directly, you know, as an archivist, how do you think about X, Y, or Z? And as, a, as an historian, how do you? Um, one of the things I'm gonna suggest, I, I'm not sure um, if you maybe have already done this, but for those of you who are particularly interested in the kinds of interpretive questions and the um, kind of ethical questions that arise when you do interviews, um, if you haven't already listened to our podcast, have any of you heard our podcast? Oh, you. great. Um, yay. <laughs> um, but the rest of you also, in, in that podcast, we take clips from our interviews and then discuss them. And a lot of what we're doing is grappling with these kind of ethical and interpretive and pedagogical questions about what happens when you do oral history. So um, that's one way for you all to kind of after this ex explore that with us more and I would I would highly recommend that you that you do that. Um, do you want to uh, give the kind of overview of SOHP or? Yeah well we have two short like very short videos that I wanted to play for you all that um, I'm going to try to do the screen share thing. All right. Are you, do you see like what's on my computer now? <laughs> so do you, do you guys see this video or is it still just our faces? No, we see it. Okay, great. So this is, um, in the video, you're going to hear from Jacqueline Hall, who is the, um, the woman who founded the oral history program. From the very beginning, the oral history program has had at least three broad missions. It's had the mission of going out and interviewing people and doing the hard work of making those interviews part of an archive, working with people to make them available to historians and other people to use and read and learn from and write history from. We've also had the mission of engaging undergraduate students and graduate students in learning to use interviews in their own work and in their own in their own creative work and creative work of all kinds not just writing dissertations and writing books but making documentary films and um, creating performances and so on thirdly we've had the mission of um, going beyond the university to help people in local communities learn to do and to do uh, oral history themselves I think we can say that we have played a really important role in moving oral history from the margins to the center of scholarly writing and research. So yeah, Jacqueline kind of outlines our three main uh, missions from the beginning, research, teaching, and public engagement. Um, and we'll t we can talk more about those. And then, this is the second time this is the one. All right, so this is, this is a second video. Um, so a few, in, uh, I guess 2014, we had a big celebration for our 40th anniversary. And so this is, um, this is from, that's the same music. I think it's different. Oh, 
So what I really like about that last video um, is we heard from Howard Lee at the end. He was the, the man that was on the stage speaking at the end, talking about how um, we can really use oral histories as a way to learn about the past and to have, you know, like young people, students, people who are doing research right now, they can look at the past and help make connections with what's come before and really see how it applies and relates to, to life today, which obviously is very important and um, can be really powerful just in understanding the world. Um, but I think both of those videos also give sort of a sense of some of the different work that we do. Um, so we work, we have um, undergraduate students that work as interns for us throughout um, the semester. We have grad students who are doing research. Um, there have been books published based on research in our collection. Um, we've given walking tours in the past, like of campus, um, that sort of highlight different important moments in, in university history at UNC. Um, and you saw a little bit of a public performance that we gave using some of the interviews um, and a lot more. So I just thought that would be a good little, a good little way to give you a sense of some of the different types of work that we do. Um, yeah, so you were asking about um, uh, the, the structure of the SOHP. So currently we have a very small staff. Um, there's well, our we have a faculty director. She's a, a she's a um, history professor, but part of her job is to be the director of the Southern Oral History Program. I'm gen usually the associate director. the The director's on leave, so I'm currently the acting director. But usually, there's a faculty director and associate director. JC's position as coordinator of collections, and then we have these four or currently five graduate student field scholars, and they um, work for us, you know, in a, in a research uh, university, when you have graduate students, often they would be um, being a TA for a class. And instead of being a TA, they do research or they work at the SOHP. So we have 
four or five of those each semester, plus these four undergraduate interns. And that's basically how we get our work done. Um, so it's not like we have some huge team of you know paid interviewers or anything. <laughs> um, um, we do we do all of the work, and we work. Our um, interviews are housed at the Wilson Library, which is the Special Collections Library. So we are part of the Southern Historical Collection. So we also work very closely with, with the library. Um, but we're housed, our offices are in the Center for the Study of the American South, which you saw in one of the videos. It's this beautiful little white house um, where there's also a journal, Southern Cultures, um, and we have events and art exhibits. You can see some of the art behind us, um, speakers, music series, stuff like that. So um, if you're trying to kind of imagine the Southern Oral History Program, that's uh, that, that we have a few offices in a beautiful little house on, on campus. Mm -hmm. um, and what you were seeing in those videos was at Wilson Library, the, we had a big 40th anniversary celebration, and so that's that's where we did a lot of that filming. That's what you were saying. Yeah, we had curated an exhibit, sort of highlight different milestones over the past 40 years, and then there was a big public event, obviously with speakers and performances and things like that. So we consider our three kind of the three arms of what we do: research, teaching, and community engagement or outreach. So there's the research we're doing on the ground with our oral histories, there's the teaching with the interns and other and classes, and then there's working with, with communities. Mm -hmm. um, I know that several of you mentioned one of the things you were interested in was how to interpret and share your materials that you have. And I wanted to um, be sure that we kind of get to that because that's a big part of what we do and it's something that I think we can maybe help you think through a little bit. Um, because there are the kind of traditional ways of uh, doing historical research and sharing, you know, using your interviews as a source for a big research paper or something like that and that's certainly one way of doing it. Um, we have gotten more and more interested in other ways of sharing our materials. So one of the um, things that we've been doing recently, and, I, and somebody mentioned a kind of, you know, their, uh, an online archive. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we've been doing recently is making um, kind of small online exhibits about our collections where we will post some photos that have something to do with it, some clips from the interviews, some interpretation, and then links to the full interviews. Mm -hmm. So that if you, if, if someone comes to that site, gets really interested in what you're talking about, they have a way to go and listen to the whole interview. And that gets to one of the things somebody was asking about in terms of best practices, you know, and citations and things. And one of the things that we always emphasize is making sure that no matter how you're sharing your material, there is some way for someone to go from there to the full interview so that they can, just like, you know, if you're citing a book, um, a quote from a book, someone can go and look at that in the, in, in the book. Yeah. So there's lots of different ways to do that, but that is definitely something we consider a best practice, is always making sure that your listener or your audience has a way to go to the full interview if they want to see where that came from. Yeah, and I think we also really believe that the context matters, and so that's exactly it. We want to make sure that even if someone only hears like a two or three minute clip from one interview in our collection, that they can go back to the whole thing and really understand, you know, more about where, you know, where that particular clip is coming from, what the person was talking about before, maybe what, you know, what their life is like, um, what the rest of the interview is going into. And then from there, obviously, you can go into the rest of the archival collection and see other interviews that we conducted, um, you know, related to that project. Because we normally will do sort of big research projects and do a number of interviews about a given topic with, you know, 10, 15, 20 different people. Is a question. Mm -hmm. How do you do with confidentiality and voice?
especially, I mean, depending on the topic that you're talking about, um, because I'm particularly exploring sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. So those kind of personal experiences, I don't, in the written text, you can't identify potentially their voice. So how do you, is, that, or is there a consent process where are you just doing topics that don't, have that kind of stake to them or because typically as you know the oral history is that's the point people's name they want to be remembered right. people who don't want to be they want to be remembered their stories but their names they don't want to attach i think that's ultimately a, yeah. a problematic mm -hmm. right so we do we have a consent process um we, you know, we have these agreement forms that sort of lay out how the interviews are going to be used. We make it really clear that they're, um, if they have no restrictions, that we'll put them online in our collection because we, you know, we're doing this so that the stories can be captured and shared with a really um, broad audience. And so we try to make that really clear on the release form. We don't want any confusion about that. Um, but you're right, we usually conduct interviews with people who we want their names attached to it because they're telling their story and that obviously gives it much more context when you can do research about that person's life sort of beyond the interview. But in terms of um, handling like really sensitive topics, we don't, um, we don't offer, we, I guess we don't conduct a lot of interviews where the person's identity is like, is totally, um, right. where they don't, yeah, where they don't want it to be acknowledged at all. Um, and that's sort of just part of that is the research that we're doing. We're not doing a lot of interviews. Um, well, except in New Roots. In New Roots we are, yeah. Um, so the majority of them are not that Well, way. but we do have, we do have, um, so generally what we do, is, and it, you know, one of the things that is, um, makes us different than than, um, for instance, a student doing interviews for a particular project where they need to share this right away. We, because we are an archive and we're going to be here for generations, we can do interviews with people. They can, after they do the interview, um, they can, on our agreement forms, they can say, well, I want this to go into the archives, but I want it to be closed for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone to be able to see it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's generally how we handle those kinds of things. If it turns out that an interview is about a really sensitive topic, because sometimes an interview becomes about a sensitive topic without you meaning it to be mm -hmm. right and i the um example that i t tell my students about is i was interviewing this woman because she was a you know a leader in the community and she was a politician and she was a very public figure and i asked her some question about her parents and and she said something about her father that just it sounded a little strange to me and so i asked a follow-up question and this whole painful story of incest just came pouring out of her. And she had not in any way planned to tell me that story. Um, and so afterwards, we had this long conversation about kind of what to do. And basically what she ended up saying was she wanted it to go in the archives, but she wanted it closed for 20 years or something. Um, but that, you know, she said, I want people to know that you can be the victim of something like incest and overcome it and have a, have a productive and powerful life years later. So I want that story in there and I don't, I don't want to, you know, take that part out or anything, but it's important to me that it be later, you know, a after my political career is over and all those kinds of things. So, but there is this one other, someone was asking about the New Roots Project and many, or at least some of the people in the New Roots Project are undocumented immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so those interviews, we, the woman running that project has worked very, very hard with her interviewers and with the archives and the archivists 
to um, provide complete anonymity. I mean, the, some of those people are um, using um, pseudonyms yeah. and um, all identifying information about, you know, where their kids go to school or anything like that has, you know, has been protected, has been erased. So there are a few instances where we have done something like that. Um, but you know, if you're going into the field, um, particularly to interview about very, I mean, you said sexual harassment. I'm not sure what your kind of definition of that is, but to do real, you know, interviews about very painful topics with people that might be considered um, a vulnerable population, you really need to think through the ethics of that, the, the, how you're protecting the people, how you are, um, you know, asking questions in ways that won't be, um, that, that allow them to not answer them, right, if mm -hmm. they don't want to answer them. You know, so there's just a lot of things that, that are um, really complex about sort of setting out to do an interview about something you know is going to be um, difficult or, or painful or, or something like that. that um, and I think one of the best things you can do is just be very open with your interviewees that, you know, they don't have to answer a question if it makes them uncomfortable. They can stop the interview at any time. If they want to turn off the recorder, that's, that's fine. And um, sort of like Rachel was talking about, to have a really open conversation with them about if they want to close the interview, especially if something did come up that maybe they weren't um, expecting, but it's, it's totally fine if they want to close an interview for a given amount of time. But it sounds like what you're concerned about more is you've done the interviews, now how do you present them but maintain their anonymity? Is that, is that right? Well, specifically because you guys, um, uh, you can release podcasts, podcasts or like the verbal voice. I think not having the verbal voice um, protects them in some way on this campus because we're such a small school where I know that if you heard them speaking, you'd immediately know who they were. Right. And also the people that they mentioned and the groups that they belong to. So. Right. Well, so we would never put anyone's voice online or on the podcast if they said they didn't give permission or want to be identified, right? So basically, once they give permission and feel okay with their story being shared, then you, you, you know, you want to check, I guess, in some cases with them, are you sure it's okay if I put this on a podcast? But, um, but basically, yeah, they're giving their permission um, for this to be a public a public story, mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's important to make sure people know what that means and what that might mean on a small campus, and you know those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Question. Yeah. Um, so, correct. You're the historian, right? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Or, oh, great, great. So, one of the problems I'm still having with oral histories is like the analytical piece of it and how to analyze. I mean, we talked about it all semester, but I feel like I'm still not grasping it. So, when you do like analyze your oral histories and you try to craft your own narratives, like what are some research practices that you do in doing that so you're not like changing their voice at all while still letting them speak? So, if you can talk to that at all. I'm not sure I know what you mean by changing their voice. By changing their voice, oftentimes a lot of oral historians, from what I've read, they often just put stuff out there and then don't analyze it at all. That way they don't feel like I'm saying anything that they didn't say that makes sense. Uh huh. So, right. So, so one way of presenting oral histories, um, you're right. I mean, so I'm, I'm struggling with this right now. I'm writing a book and I went out and interviewed about 25 current day feminist activists around the country, not just in the South, but around the country. And my transcripts are 60, 70 pages long, but the format of the book is going to be short, um, short kind of excerpts from the, you know, kind of short stories in a sense, based on this, this much longer interview that I've done. And then I will write little introductions to each 
to each one and an introduction to the book. So that's the kind of format of the, and put them into chapters and write an introduction to the chapter. Um, but, you know, editing a, a, a 70 page transcript down to a 10 page story means that I'm making choices about what's important, what's less important about how, how to kind of frame the story, how to, um, you know, I'm doing that partly based on what was most compelling in my conversation with this person, but also based on themes that I see kind of emerging between the interviews. Um, and yeah, every time I cut out a big, you know, 15 pages or something, I'm, I'm struggling with is what if I'm doing this wrong or what, you know, um, what if they would really not agree with, with this, this story that emerges um, when you condense it in this way. So, you know, one thing that we often do, um, one practice that you can do is to send your interpretation to the interviewee if they're still alive. You can say, here's the, here's the story that I'm writing, what do you think? and then you can have a conversation with them. Now, sometimes that leads to um, disagreements. You may not agree, the two of you may not agree on the important interpretation of this. Um, you know, if I was interviewing, uh, you know, there's, did you all read Kathleen Blee's piece about um, women in the KKK? Not for this class, but. That's a good one to put on the syllabus next time, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a really powerful piece where this white woman historian interviews white women who were involved in the KKK in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and because she, the, the historian was white, the women in the KKK just assumed that, they, that she shared their, you know, their way of thinking about the world. And so they told her all this stuff about being in the KKK with no shame, no anything. And, um, and then she wrote this interpret, you know, this interpretation of them. And she talks about, you know, cause there's a lot of feminists, particularly feminist historians who would say, you really have to share your interpretation with the person and let them talk back to it and let you know and that needs to be a kind of shared authority and, and a shared interpretation and Kathleen Blee said no way am I giving these women any more authority right like you know they've had their say I'm interpreting them now um, and they would not agree with me and I don't care right like I'm not I'm not giving them any more power than they already had um, so there's disagreements among historians about this, about how much you need to share authority with your interviewees. Um, this isn't it. Uh, Kathy Bleed's a sociologist, right? Um, that may be right. I'm not sure. I've read across her work in sociology, in graduate school. So it's interesting because that, do you, um, this is a question I don't know the answer to. Usually I ask questions I already know the answer to. But yeah. <laughs> Isn't there a disciplinary difference? So in sociology, one of the things I did not like, they really forced you to interpret and forget about what the people who you interviewed said. Mm -hmm. they, you were leading this and you were a failure if you were just letting the data speak for itself. I find in history though, they're more likely to let those, you know, narratives, I mean, the oral uh, histories kind of tell the story. Mm -hmm. Fashion and literature, other fields may do it differently, but I'm wondering what you think about, there's a disciplinary, there are disciplinary differences in how one does yeah. it. I, I think that's true. Go well, I would, add, I would add ethnography to the mix also um, as being a field where they really view it as like a shared product. Right. Um, just like even the terminology that they use, instead of saying interview me, they say like partner or collaborator, or um, they really view it as something that you're producing with the community that you're observing. Um, and so there's certainly not like a right or wrong, but 
Um, I think you're right, though, that there are disciplinary differences, yeah. and it, as um, and it, there are also uh, differences in um, even the kinds of books people are writing. So, what I, the book I described to you that I'm writing is not what an historian would call a monograph in a sense. I'm not laying out a grand interpretation of feminism in the 21st century into which I'm folding bits and pieces of these people's voices. I am sort of saying, I interviewed a bunch of really kick-ass women. <laughs> Here, here's, here's what they are doing. Here, you know, here's their stories. Um, I'm, I'm going to sort of say here are some themes that I see emerging from these, but I am gonna let them speak, basically. And my hope is that in classrooms and you know, people will read the actual stories and pull from them what they, you know, their own interpretation. Because partly I'm interested in that kind of pedagogical move, right? That I want the students to learn to interpret the, the primary sources rather than relying on me, the historian, to do that interpretation for them. But if I were trying to get tenure or something, this book would not count. I, I was that when you said what you were doing, I was like, yeah, it wouldn't fly. But, but it's important work, and I think it's important, especially for those topics we don't know much about. Those mm -hmm. first, right. those that, like she's breaking new ground in this kind of way with her work around sexual harassment and the way she's mm -hmm. thinking about it. Um, and you get, and that is important work for the building of the field. So right. right. That's what I, I mean, I sort of felt like somebody needs to capture these voices right now. And it is, it's kind of too soon to try to think about what 21st century feminism meant, right? And it, if you ask me today, uh, my interpretation is going to be pretty different than it would have been three days ago. So, um, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it, right. We, I, I'm, I'm kind of pulling together a collection of primary sources with a gesture at interpretation, but, but I'm not, I'm not doing the kind of, um, monograph. So I'm not, you know, I don't know if I've really answered your question, except to say, I think there are m m different ways of doing this. Yeah. It is always a struggle. Um, and I think, you know, I'm sure you all have talked about this. One of the things that, um, well, we just got back from the Oral History Association conference a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, one of the conversations we were having, I was having with a few people was, um, if you read articles that are published in the Journal of Oral History, there's a lot of emphasis on, um, you know, interpreting how, how the orality of oral history, right? And that you can learn so much more by listening to the voices than just reading the transcript and that we have to really pay attention to all of those kinds of things. When you actually read straight history that's using oral history as a source, that's almost never done, mm -hmm. right? They, they, they take, they, they, they look at a transcript of an interview, they pull out a section, you know, when the person's remembering what it was like to go to a segregated school or something, they use that as part of their evidence for building their argument, they move on. 90% of the time, they're not listening to the actual audio. Um, they have no idea what that person's voice actually sounded like, um, and they're not, particularly interested in the um, the oral cues to the emotions or you know something like that so um, people who talk about kinds of theories of oral history do things quite differently um, than historian you know sort of regular historians who maybe are using transcripts of oral histories as part of their archival research mm -hmm. um so you know there's just a lot of different 
ways of approaching. There's hope for that. I just came back from a conference, and I can't tell you the number of times I've heard people mention sonic studies. Mm -hmm. Studies, sound, discourse. It's like, so that's the new thing, moving yeah. text to sound and actually listening to it. So I think most fields are, people are doing this work. Right. And that's really been made possible by, by the digitization of Right. of oral histories because now you don't necessarily have to go to the archives get to the cassette. get the little cassette <laughs> and listen to it you know. yes. yeah. and i think that some of the scholarship is changing too and even just how like what different types of scholarship are considered legitimate is changing you know like now people are doing so many more digital humanities projects that's really putting the voice at the forefront and like we're we have a grad student right now who i think her dissertation is actually charlotte i think it's going to be um, a large part of it is really going to be more of a digital humanities project and less of a written document because um, like she's very aware of the power of the actual orality and the sound and just the layers of, um, of meaning that you can get from that alone. And so I think that's something um, that we'll see more of just as technology is changing and as different digital platforms are becoming, um, I think, viewed as like very legitimate sources. Can I add, I feel like we're colleagues going back and forth. This mm -hmm. is exciting. So one of the things I've seen, I was at Denison and someone gave a presentation. It was a lit person, believe it or not. Um, no, I'm just playing, just, that's just a joke. Um, but what they did, it was an oral history of someone's grandmother. And I need to go find it because I want to use it in class. And instead of words and talking, you know how you look at documentaries, right? All you saw the entire time was the mother making tamales. It was mm -hmm. a and it was so powerful because you saw all the work and the hands and it was telling its own story. Mm -hmm. I think it, it on some level we should do more of that kind of mm -hmm. thing. I've only seen it once. That I mean that um so there's two things. I don't want to forget to talk about performance. Oh, yeah. um, but the other thing that I'm thinking about as you're saying that is, you know, one of the things that's going on in the field is um, a higher and more and more interest in and pressure to do video oral histories. Um, and we, um, the Southern Oral History Program has not done a lot of that. We were hired by the Smith a few years ago and did um, I think a total of like 150 um, video oral histories of civil rights activists that are now in the new Museum of African American History and that was the first um, real experience that we had had with with video oral histories and I know that I was very I was a little resistant and nervous about, you know, it's, it's when you have a recorder on the table between you, usually after a while, the person kind of forgets that it's there and they sort of relax and they, you know, they're telling you their story. I thought with these lights and the camera and all of that, that that's never going to happen, right? They're, they're always going to be very aware of that audience and and that it was going to really change the performing in some way yeah performing it was going to change the nature and that that may be true but watching those oral histories just like we say you can get a lot from the voice that you can't get from the transcript you could get a lot from the facial expressions that you couldn't get just from the voice and so that was kind of fascinating to us and um uh, you know, we, someone is now um, donating a collection of 200 video oral histories to us, um, which will be our first major collection of, of video oral histories. And so that, that uh, more and more people in the field are doing that as video cameras get, you know, cheaper and easier to manage. But, and also, you know, one of the problems it causes for us is that just the digital storage space for that right. is so huge that we had to go through this whole process with our library of trying to make sure we were going to have digital enough you know, space on the server to manage this. So every step forward with technology, you know, there's problems that come along with it. I have a yeah. What are you going to say? I wanted to talk about performance because I think it could be helpful to several of you who are thinking about 
Um, somebody had mentioned sharing their work with, with um, administration and stuff. So I wanted to tell you about this project that we just did. Um, we have some audio if you want to play any of that too. Oh, from Black, Black Pioneers? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'll tell you a little bit and then we'll play you some audio. So um, last year, our, every year our four interns, um, or every semester our four interns take on a research project together. And um, last year, they interviewed members of what are called the Black Pioneers, which were the first generation from 52 to 72, the first 20 years of Black um, students at UNC Chapel Hill. And they, though, that group has been meeting together um, since the late 90s, mm -hmm. I think. They named themselves the Black Pioneers. That, that's their name. And um, they come back to campus and they have these kind of um, reunions together, but their story had never really been told. And so we um, undertook to do an oral history interview with them, uh, interviews with them. And um, then uh, the undergraduates put together, created a script. So they took excerpts from, they did a total of, each semester they did a total of eight interviews and they pulled excerpts from these interviews into a script. So they talked um, about sort of where the students had come from, like the towns that they had grown up in, where they had lived. They talked about arriving at UNC's campus. Many of them told stories of, you know, arriving to their dorm rooms, meeting their white, um, uh, roommate, they would, they and their parents would go to lunch, they would come back, their roommate was gone, had moved out, right? This was repeated multiple times. They talked about um, uh, working with professors and the problems that they had with professors. They talked about, you know, so they, they pulled, they found themes in these interviews and pulled quotes from the different interviews that kind of worked almost as a conversation together um, and created a performance, which they performed. And then uh, a man on campus, Joseph Meagle, who is a professional um, theater guy and runs something called the Process Series, saw this performance and was so blown away by the content of it that he asked us if he could take the two scripts from the two different semesters, create one larger script, and then have professional black actors perform this. And that just happened this past weekend during homecoming weekend um, when the black pioneers themselves were in the audience, the chancellor of the university was in the audience, a lot of people were in the audience and heard this really powerful previously untold story by these, um, these students who, you know, told incredibly painful stories of what it was like and at the same time voiced a real loyalty to the university and a desire for this complexity of this story, both, both the pain and the loyalty to be recognized and to be shared. And it was a really, really moving, moving. Um, it, and uh, many of the actors were also um, alumni. So, it, you know, it was these multiple levels of this story being brought forward. And it, uh, it was really quite incredible. So, um, do you, which audio do you have? I have um, Sandra Burford and Shardinia Dunn. All right, so we can play you a couple clips from some of the interviews. Let's see what numbers I wanted, nine, okay. Uh, moving into school today, and um, to the, I was in Connor doing this, I was trying to think, I said, oh, what dorm did I live in? You hear it? It's kind of a screen share, and that might make it louder. Oh, okay. And, and going into the room, and uh, my roommate was already there. My dad took me, because my mother had to work that day, my dad took me. And we were getting mm -hmm. things, and That's we noticed funny. the young lady and her family were missing. They decided. Yeah. It says, um, you know, since you told me about your, your first roommate, um, 
do you remember any other like personal encounters on campus um like in regards to racial relations or other than the fact that um you don't get included if like even if sometime in the dorm if there are things going on in a certain group they may feel like you don't you wouldn't feel comfortable being involved with their little group set you know what i'm saying you find out later you think Oh, why why y'all do such and such? Oh, well, we just decided this group of us. But like, if you're in the dorm on the hall, you know, it kind of be nice to be invited, whether you want or not. I always remember that. I guess. I, you can know, can you hear it well enough for it to be worth it? Maybe a little bit. I know. Yeah, it's getting lower. Yeah. Okay. There's the next. The next one I think is a little bit louder. It, it was just that interview. You had a really quiet voice. Um, we'll see if this one's better. And when you would be in the midst of is that better Americans or whatever they were, um, even if they were foreigners, you just felt uh, like uh, they were invisible. You didn't even see them. You only your eyes were open only when you were in your own neighborhood mm -hmm. or stores. Uh, uh, activities where black people were and then you saw people and you recognize them <laughs> you speak to them otherwise you had to be careful i just feel that a lot of times people miss understanding what it was like in the segregation years because we live american blacks lived in a subculture we felt like we had a full life we had a wonderful life in our culture but outside of it it was oppressive it was a, like a ceiling that you couldn't get beyond but the things you could do you could enjoy beyond high school what would happen on that nice. okay uh, when you describe seems very e. patrick johnson <laughs> yeah, he was he was one of the actors that came back for the performance. He's actually one of my friends, and we have a student in here who is applying to Northwestern and to work with him. Great. Um, so yeah, we know he Patrick Johnson quite well. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's similar to Patrick, except um, there's multiple people performing, right? And and. Um, well, Honey Pot has multiple did a showing. Um, Sweet Tea is just one person. I went to uh, see a Wake Forest when he had, you know, these different people, women. Um, mm. I like it's interesting to put a white person uh, performing blackness in that way. I think playing with that is interesting too. Well, one of the, I'm, I'm sure you all have talked about this in your class, but you know, one of the really interesting things that we got to talk with the interns about, because who did the interviews, two of the interns were white and two of the interns were black. And so we got to have a conversation about how the interviews went differently um, when you had a white person interviewing black people about that time period versus black mm -hmm. and the kind of I don't want to say pros and cons but the differences in the interviews and how you want know, you know what the interns kind of decided was it wasn't like one was better or worse because they were different because when the um, African when the black pioneers were talking to the black interns they often would assume knowledge of something um, and sort of jump over details, basically be like, well, you know what that was like, right? And so I don't need to, I don't need to talk, I don't need to tell the story. So in terms of, it was a very, very powerful experience for the interns to talk to them. Um, the results of the interviews in terms of sharing information or sharing details of experiences or something, were sometimes less because there was an assumed recognition or assumed shared experience. So, you know, there, it, it was very um, powerful for the four of them to talk about those differences of experiences in doing the interviews and what they learned from that. Yeah. Oh, I, I was just going to speak to doing my two interviews with women talking about sexual harassment like experiences in grade school 
they in both interviews often ended their sentences with things like that looking to me for confirmation and I feel like being a woman mm -hmm. I definitely got a lot of like you know this too or like but I very much thought that I was understanding but then I was becoming critical of like I need to ask specifics mm -hmm. name specific behaviors for mm -hmm. me yeah. um, and like sometimes wishing that I would have asked those questions sooner but like that's been interesting with your positionality mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 Other questions? Um, I guess like I have um, some questions because it sounds like you guys are doing a really cool new project. Um, so new roots. So like, how do you guys um, choose like which project, what narrative you guys? Um, yeah. Um, you guys choose to focus on and. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what the implications of that are. Um, Cause you guys also seem to work with a whole host of different topics. Right. Or, you know, um, just, um, just wanting to speak to that as well. Yeah. Good question, I had to piggyback to that as well. Um, so with our oral history process, the way I'm understanding it, we're supposed to be taking everyone's transcripts, um, who all focused on different things within community learning. So you can, can you talk about how you take these different topics and put it under one umbrella topic too, if you've done that as well? Mm -hmm. But that came out right. I can reword it, but that didn't come out right. Yeah, I can. I guess I can speak to the first question um, first, real quick. Um, so, New Roots in particular um, is sort of the project of of somebody who's an anthropologist at UNC, and she like started this project, and then after doing it for several several years, came to us when she realized that she wanted it to have an archive somewhere. And the project has grown because we got grant funding to do all these different things, and I think that sort of that's one example of how we do so many different projects. Um, we as an oral, like as the SOHP have, you know, several of our own research focuses every year, but we do partner with so many different people on campus who can sort of take the lead on the real research part of it, but we work with them to do different parts, like to put it in the archive or um, like maybe we'll give people workshops or we can help them sort of think through if they want to have an exhibit or they want to give their own performance. Um, so that's one way that really that we're able to do so many different things is because we do collaborate so much with other people on campus um, and off campus. So some, right. you know, if you look at we have what five thousand, almost six thousand, almost six thousand interviews in our collection. Many of those have been done by us, you know, our graduate students, staff here at SOHP over the last 40 years, but many of them also have been donated to us by, you know, people around the South who've done, the, you know, they're writing a book or something and they did a hundred interviews with such and such a group and then they don't want those interviews to just sit on their shelf um, and never get deposited in an archive. So they call us and say, hey, I have these 100 interviews, do you want them? Mm -hmm. So over the last 40 years, a significant proportion of our interviews have come to us from um, professional researchers, communities, churches, you know, other groups who have donated their stuff to us. Mm -hmm. And um, we work, so our, one way that we decide how to focus on our own research though is with the internship. Um, we've been doing that since 2012, and we have generally focused on student activism at UNC because we have undergraduates doing the research. That's one, we think, really great way for them to sort of understand the university that they are part of and to see where people were coming from at different points. Um, so within the, you know, within the smaller umbrella of student activism, that's how we sort of narrow down one research area. But we also, I mean, often we'll have researchers or just other people come to us and say, like, this is an area that in the South that hasn't been covered yet. Like, I have some funding. Do you want to like do this project? Um, so we we get a lot of different ideas from a lot of different places. But we also do generally. So for the first forty years of the SOHP, the SOHP was run by Jacqueline Dowd Hall, the woman you saw in that first interview, and she was a civil rights and women's historian and labor historian, and so the vast majority of the big research projects that were done were done under her intellectual leadership. And I can't emphasize to you enough the incredible um, 
leadership of the field that she demonstrated and that the, her legacy, these thousands of interviews that are here now, allow researchers for the, you know, the next generations to continue to do really important interpretive work because of what she went out and did with her graduate students. Um, and now, you know, over the last three years after she retired, we've been through sort of, you know, a series of interim directors and directors. Now, in January, Melinda Maynard Lowry is coming back. Um, uh, and she will pretty much be in charge of the intellectual, you know, um, direction of the, of the program. Um, one of our big uh, Melinda is a Lumbee Indian and um, is really interested in the rural South. And so a lot of what we are thinking we're going to focus on in the coming years is about um, sort of race and class in rural areas. Um, uh, what does segregation look like in rural areas um, when there aren't, you know, movie theaters and things like that? How do roads and transportation and infrastructure um, reflect uh, race and class? So um, those are the kinds of things that we're starting to look at now uh, more. And so I think you'll see a kind of developing focus that builds on our long legacy and moves in new interesting directions. Mm -hmm. There was a second question, and I think yeah. it's a great question, and it is, so you have all these interviews, these individual interviews, and often they're around a topic, mm -hmm. but often, I keep saying often, but, but sometimes historians, sociologists, historical sociologists in particular, might go in and look across. It, it may be the way in which we thought about a social phenomena or an event, that people are looking across these yeah. different oral histories and drawing from. So I know teacher, if you're doing teacher research, you might find teachers in civil rights yeah. versus, right? And so when you have to do that, how do you, he wants to know, and I'll, I'll with that as a background, I'll let him go and restate what he wants to know. <laughs> uh, I wanted to know how you would draw from these different topics and write it into a common thematic topic, like you were saying earlier, even though they might necessarily be on different things. Like the interview was on, like when you say you got donations from different people who did interviews, even though they weren't interviewing on your topic, how would you draw from that in your own topic, if that makes sense? Do you, do you mean how would we draw from it when we're interpreting them or in the, how do we put them in the archive? Interpreting. Okay. Um, so we're really lucky in that all of our material, thanks to the hard work of JC and other archivists, is searchable by keyword and by, you know, there's, there's many different ways to search for these things. Um, and so, you know, I, I would be um, searching for evidence in, a, in, a, in multiple different ways across the whole Southern Oral History programs collections yeah. um, and, and finding those things. I mean, that's one of the things we always are teaching our students about. It's, ha it's hard work to find those because, you know, if you search, let's say you're interested in um, how Christianity affects people's approaches to social activism. If I do a keyword search for Christianity, um, I'll get one set of interviews. If I do a keyword search on Baptist, I'm gonna get a different set of interviews. And if I do a keyword search on, you know, pastor, I'm gonna get a different set, <laughs> right? So um, I think then, uh, so there's the finding them, that's one part of the work. And then there's the interpreting them. And, you know, I don't think that that's, very different, I guess, than interpreting letters that you find in different collections or diaries or um, those kinds of, I mean, I think that's the, that's the historical um, interpretive work that you have to do. I do, I do think for your own sense of, um, you know, those questions we ask ourselves, right, when we're looking at a historical document, or source, 
right? What's the context for this source? Who was their audience? What are they trying to convey? What are they conveying by accident or, you know, unconsciously? Um, yeah, what were their like intentional research questions, but what were they uncovering in addition to that? Yeah, I mean, so you, you're asking yourself questions about the interviewee, but also questions about the interviewer and, you know, what were the questions they asked this person? Um, and, uh, you know, those might be different questions than you would have wanted to ask that person if you had them in front of you. And that can be really frustrating. Um, I mean, reading an oral history when, or listening to one, when they don't ask the follow-up question mm -hmm. that seems so obvious to you and you really would have asked. I mean, if you're lucky, that person is still alive and maybe you can go do a second interview with them or something. But um, I think you just need to do all of that same kind of historical interpretive work that you would do if you were reading in six different newspapers or reading in you know, letters from six different um, things. I, am, am I, is that answering your question? That's a, that's a very good response. Part of it is, you're, you're right, it, we're, that's always a problem, whether you work with oral histories or whether you're working with archival like, letters or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, everything in, in an interview is gonna be relevant to your topic, right? Right. Yeah, so, so you, one of the things I was going to say is that um, when we train our interviewees, I mean our interviewers, one of the things that we train them to do is life history interviews. So even if what I'm particularly interested in is sexual harassment or, you know, feminist activism in 2012, um, I'm going to do a life history interview where I start with their what they remember about their grandparents and their parents and their childhood and their you know growing up and and part of that's because context is important and we don't think you can really understand how or why a person responds to a particular event or a particular you know moment that I'm interested in without understanding their family and you know all of that but it's also because these are, we're very conscious of you, right? These, these are going to an archive. Researchers are gonna come along later who aren't interested in feminist activism in 2012. They're interested in how Syrian immigrants were experiencing life in New York City in 2001, right? I mean, so, people are gonna come along with different research questions, but I try to, you know, that's why I try to capture as much as I can about this person's life so that it will be as rich as it possibly can for future researchers to come along who might be interested in totally different questions than I am. Mm -hmm. I think we need to wrap up time-wise. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, JC. This is so that. enjoyable and stimulating. Yeah. And oh, good. Good. <laughs> Person, so thank you. So, well, one thing I wanted to say to the two faculty members, um, we could do this by email, but we have something called the faculty affiliates of SOHP, and we would love to invite the two of you to join that. Mm -hmm. And you could be on our list, but also come, if you have the flexibility, you could come once a semester. We have meetings here and we talk about this kind of stuff. So. I will look at that email today, but I also, I'm excited about that. But I also have 44 interviews with black teachers in Nash, Edgecombe, Wilson counties collected oh. for my dissertation that I am going to give to you. Email me. Yeah. yeah email <laughs> um, and also, I really want to encourage all of you to listen to our podcast because we talk about this kind of stuff a lot. And I think a lot of our topics would be of particular interest to you. Mm -hmm. um, and then Go on, you. Uh, what is it? iTunes and rate us and <laughs> 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 thank, thank you so much. You.